he's a plain Jane, Brum, so they say, but as strong as the bones of the bull she's built on and as tough as the trade she's tinkered. Hello, that's the opening verse of My Lady Brum by Penny Harper, praising this city that's transformed itself in recent years. And there's a strong poetic feel about reading aloud today and all the usual inspirational ideas for using books in the classroom, plus a lot more besides. Also in this week's show, Canines in the Classroom, how a story about a boy and his dog inspired shape poetry. A singer called Sally serenades us. Writer Ruth Padell gets passionate about poetry. It concentrates you, it helps your mind, it helps your body. And our panel enjoy Kite Flying in Kabul. Teaching poetry can seem like one of the most difficult things to do. Of course, I make my living out of writing and performing it. But when I was a child, I can well remember how odd it all seemed to be. A bit unfriendly and mostly about things I wasn't interested in. So here now are my top five tips on how to make your classroom poetry friendly. Get children to make their own anthologies of the poems they like. Make your own poem posters and put up new ones every week. Get the children to rehearse and perform poems in groups of two or three. Read poems to the class at the end of the day when they know that you can't ask questions about it. When you read poems together, try asking them questions that you don't know the answers to. And one more, find the right material. And one book I'd recommend is Love That Dog by Sharon Creech. It's a novel written in poetic form as a diary about a boy who has to write a poem in class and goes on to write more and more for himself. And it went down a storm with this year seven class. And my dad came Key words in the verse, like the name of the boy's dog, Sky, were shared amongst the year seven class as they joined teacher Lorna Sewell in a reading. And I turned round and saw a blue car, blue car, splattered with mud, speeding down the road. And I saw Sky going after the ball, wag, wag, wagging his tail. And I called him Sky, Sky, Sky. But it was too late because the blue car, blue car splattered with mud hit sky. Thud, thud, thud. And kept on going in such a hurry so fast. And sky closed his eyes and he never opened them again. The book's about Jack, an 11-year-old boy who has had problems relating to other students and bit by bit his teacher, Miss Stretchbury, manages to unravel why Jack is so quiet and why he's so um, inattentive. And the key part of the story is when he reveals that it's the loss of his dog that has caused all this inner turmoil. And it's a very touching story of a boy coming to terms with something as commonplace as losing a pet he loved. Using verbs and nouns linked to the dog, the children created their own shape poems. They use the verbs to create um, the movement of the, the animal and they use the nouns inside the shape of the animal. Um, they draw it in pencil, fill it in with the words that they've chosen that they like and they rub out the shape of the animal and there it is. you used role play with the children how did that go um it was very compelling who is this dog it's my yellow dog and ha has it got a name it's called sky we had Why two students who were playing jack and miss stretchbury yeah. his teacher and jack bought his poem his shape poem of the, his dog to the front and started to explain to me Stretchberry why he'd chosen the dog, um, and he clammed up. Playing out in the street, and I don't want to say no more. Come on, Jeff, what do you It was on? really good to see the empathy and the understanding um, come to life in front of your eyes in a role play. So that was very absorbing, I think. It was sad how the dog passed away, and it was because it does happen like that. My dog was. Uh, kind of like that dog. <laughs> when the story of Kim and my dog comes up, then I do get a little bit emotional sometimes. 
uh, ran away and we heard it got hit by a car later. And it died. So I feel sorry for Jack. Now we're off to the Regency Spa town of Cheltenham, home to the world's largest and oldest literary festival. Poetry has become a big part of the event, with performers like Sally Crabtree entertaining visitors with her special tree. She calls it a poet tree. Get it? All the objects on the tree have got a song, a story or a poem um, connected to them. So people come up to the poetry, they choose an object off the tree, and whatever they choose, I serenade them. I'm the moon without the night to shine. I'm a glass without the wine. I'm a wedding with no... I've got this philosophy that people love poetry as long as you present it in the right way and, you know, don't make it scary. It's basically almost like a storytelling tree, I suppose. Um, it's just a means of encouraging the children to use their imaginations. Um, I get the kids to make up songs with me, um, make up poems. Sometimes we act little things out. But it's just a great tool because I can change all the objects on the tree. I can take them off, change them for different things. So it's constantly growing. It doesn't get boring for me and hopefully not for the kids either. <laughs> Sally takes her poet tree into schools to encourage more reading and writing of verse. I think poetry is, is becoming really alive. Um, children have always got it. They're, they haven't lost their poetic um, sensibility. But because of the national curriculum, it's clamping down, clamping down, everything has to be formula. You know, it's quite hard to encourage children to really, really use their imaginations. But nowadays, so many poets go into schools and so many teachers are really encouraging it. I think. I think and I hope it's going to, you know, make a comeback, perhaps. Thank you. Thank so you. <laughs> Thank you very Someone else who's passionate about poetry and who believes that children should be taught to learn it by heart, and I don't disagree with her about that, is Ruth Padell. She's a busy woman, poet, music journalist, and as befits the great-great-granddaughter of Charles Darwin, she's an accomplished travel writer, too. And it was while promoting her latest travel memoir, Tigers in Red Weather, that she revealed her secret way of dealing with tension. Um, when I was travelling in the jungle, I mean, there were very scary bits, and sometimes I went in a kayak. I know people go kayaking, but I was scared, and I didn't realise I was going to go in this kayak. It was in Laos for three days through the jungle. And I was so frightened of those rapids, and I'd never been in this damn thing before. Um, but I discovered that if I learnt a poem while I was doing it, it helped. Whenever I'm scared now, when I, if I have an operation or an injection or anything, I say Tennyson to myself. It concentrates you. It helps your mind. It helps your body. It's something to, to focus on outside yourself and to think with at the same time. It's about feeling and thought. I mean, I now, in my own work, always read my poems by heart. And so I have to learn them, because some of them are quite long poems. And I've discovered that the, the great thing you have to do is to walk. Flame of the crackle glazed tangle. Amber reflected in grey milk jade. An old song remembered, long debt paid. A painting on silk which may fade. Learning by heart is, I think, the most single, most important thing about making a poem yours, making a poem yours to understand and to have and to see new meanings in as you go through life. And once you learn a poem by heart, it's there in you. And the younger you learn it, the better. Ruth Padell, her fascinating quest to discover what's being done to save tigers from extinction, took her all over Asia. And we stay on that continent for our next book, The Kite Runner by Khaled Hosseini. Our panel have been reading this book, a gripping story of a boyhood friendship destroyed by jealousy and fear in war-torn Kabul. The title refers to a crucial day in the novel, a kite-flying tournament, described beautifully by Hosseini. After another 30 minutes, only four kites remained, and I was still flying. It seemed I could hardly make a wrong move, as if every gust of wind blew my favour. I'd never felt so in command, so lucky. It felt intoxicating. I didn't dare look up to the roof, didn't dare take my eyes off the sky. I had to concentrate, play it smart. Do you think it's just a good story or is it something much more than that? 
Um, well, first and foremost, it is a fantastic story. Um, it grips the reader throughout and you just really get to understand the central character and the guilt that he feels and, and how he tries to overcome that as he moves into adulthood. Um, of course, there are a lot of background details about Afghanistan and the war at the time um, and how that impacts on the main character's life. Yes, we're, the setting for the story mm. is just to the point before the Russian invasion. Yes. And we go through to the time of the Taliban. So this is a time of tremendous upheaval in Afghanistan. And this, this is important to the book, isn't it, Gally? Well, yes, obviously, it's a, it's a, a time of upheaval, but there's, it's kind of a reflection of what's going on in, in Amir's life, as it were. There's a lot of upheaval in his life, and then how he copes with, A, losing his, his country, and B, you know, how he's kind of almost losing his, his, his best friend. Now, guilt's a driving force in the story, isn't it, Julia? Well, yes, I mean, the, the story, in a sense, the plot is predicated on the guilt that he feels when he lets his friend get into a situation and doesn't offer him any support. But actually, there are loads of other guilts. I mean, he feels guilty that his father doesn't love him because his mother died when he was born, and so he blames himself. Um, there's a lot of guilt he feels, uh, which we know when we get to the end of the book, about him having left Afghanistan at all and becoming completely westernised. I thought that was too much guilt. Too much guilt? De <laughs> definitely, I think... <laughs> I mean, we've got to remember this is Hosseini's first novel, and it's a, it's fantastic. Yes. I've got to say, as a book, it's it's fantastic. But he does love to pull the heartstrings. I mean, you, the the book starts to get a little bit dull, and then all of a sudden, bam! You know, you're you're in the middle of something that you didn't expect to be happening. But that it's constantly shocking you, isn't it? I, I, and I really enjoyed that, and I enjoyed the emotional ride that it took me on. Um, it. it it was compelling, it made me want to know what was going to happen and when I made predictions, and some of the predictions I made were right about what was going to happen, he did it in such a way that it was still shocking how he'd, how he'd approached it. Is it a book you think we could use with school students of what sort of age would you say, Stacey? It's interesting you said that, actually, because I, I did a book review on our school site earlier today about this text and I put down 15 plus because I think there are, there are some events in there that are quite disturbing to read but I think that it's it's well worth recommending to sort of GCSE or A-level students to read in their own time certainly. Gally you've worked with young people what sort of age do you think would take to well, the I'd, I'm not sure I'd read this to my eight-year-old when I'm putting him to bed or anything. No. I think possibly yeah possibly kind of the GCSE as a GCSE text where people are where children are old enough to to understand that you know life isn't just you know all smooth and, and, you know, sweets and roses. It's a very good study of childhood and the tensions within childhood. And I think, you know, for 14-plus, though it is very violent, I think for 14, 15-plus, just as a way of looking at childhood and looking at the dynamics of childhood, it would be a fantastically good book to read. Now, we've heard that the film rights have been sold on The Kite Runner, so I'm thinking ahead to the film posters. Mm. What do we reckon is going to be the tagline next to The Kite Runner? What's it going to be? Um, Possibly something like, how high does your friendship fly? Mm. Hey, <laughs> I like it. That's nearly it from Reading Aloud. Just time to return to poetry. This one always makes me smile. It's by Spike Milligan and it's called Silly Poem. Said Hamlet to Ophelia, I'll draw a sketch of thee. Which pencil shall I use? To be or not to be? Bye. <laughs> <laughs>